So if you have your Bibles with you, uh, first of all, turn with me to Psalm 126, uh, just uh, six verses in this lovely psalm, uh, but a tremendous psalm, uh, and really we're going to be looking at this morning at the soul winner's task, and uh, we have a lovely couple of verses here at the end of this psalm, as I said, really verses five and six that we want to look at a wee bit uh, this morning, a challenge for us as we look ahead to the Holiday Bible Club and as we look ahead to outreach over this uh, summer uh, period uh, with a number of young people heading away and two of them are going to be taking part this morning uh, in the service, Hannah and Matthew, they're there heading away to Romania and we're just going to ask them a few questions about that and I know there's others involved in Holiday Bible Clubs and other things as well and camps uh, as well. So Psalm 126, and we're going to read a few verses uh, from this lovely little psalm. And verse 1 of Psalm 126 says, When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, The Lord had done great things for them. The Lord had done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goes forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Tremendous word there and a lovely, uh, lovely psalm. And we'll look at a few thoughts from that lovely psalm in a wee minute. Psalm 126. Who has been wished to 
together for a wee word of prayer folks uh, please do remember in prayer sorry I forgot to announce uh, Jude has given a wee word on the Friday night uh, there to the family barbecue I asked Jude to do it uh, he knows the area here and I know we've been blessed through his ministry in the past so Jude is going to give him a wee word on Friday night do remember him in prayer it's not always the easiest meeting to speak at or to say something or know what to say uh, so please do remember him as he prepares there during the week uh, for uh, the Friday night. Let's bow in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we just want to thank you uh, for the privilege you have of meeting here together this morning. And we thank you for what we've heard so far already. And as we continue the theme on reaching out and being involved in your work, we just pray, Lord, you'll challenge our hearts afresh this morning through your word. We thank you that your word is a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our very path. We thank you the reality of the next step in our lives but also, Lord, down the road. And we just pray, Lord, you will lead us, and you'll guide us, and you'll direct us in the art of soul winning. Lord, may the Savior that we came to know and we came to love, may he be on our lips. Lord, may, may the desire to share the message of the gospel with those we come in contact with, may it be a true reality. And just challenge our hearts and bless us this morning as we gather here together around your word, because we ask it in your lovely name. Amen. Amen. Folks, if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to uh, Psalm 126. And I said it's really verse 5 and maybe just verse 6 this morning that I'm going to look at. And it says, He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Uh, many attribute, attribute, attribute the, this lovely psalm to King Hezekiah. Now, as you will see on it, it just says a song of degrees. It doesn't say a name. Uh, many of the psalms we have will attribute to different ones. If you go back to Psalm 122, it's to King David. And then Psalm 124, it's to David. The rest of them just say around it a song of degrees. But they maintain when you look at uh, many of the writings of, of First Kings, 18 and 19 you will see that when they had a tremendous victory over the Assyrian army that this was the song that was written by King Hezekiah it's a very poetical song if you if you look to just simply read it you can see how easy it is to be put to song and to put to music and a lot of the psalms that were told after the psalmist wrote them to go, or wrote them to go and to put them to song and sing them through when the lord turned again the captivity of zion we are like them the dream tremendous words if we time to go into look at the whole of this psalm it is a beautiful psalm then was our mouth filled with laughter our tongue filled with singing it's a wonderful time to show our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue filled with singing unto our God then said they among the heathen the Lord hath done great things for them and here we have a lovely picture of the heathen even at that time those who were outside of Christ, those who didn't know the Lord, as they looked at the way the Lord undertook and looked after his own people, they were even talking about the greatness of God. And I think it's a tremendous thing, isn't it? When God does a work, even those who are outside of Christ are talking about the work that God does. They're talking about a great and a mighty and an all-powerful God. And as we desire in these days, the longing is this, that the world sees the greatness of our God. And they can see that greatness in and through our lives, but it can also see uh, in it of how God is working and how God is doing things and how God is blessing and how God is saving. So the heathen were even saying, listen, here's a great, a mighty, powerful God who turned again their captivity, who changed their circumstances, who changed around their lives, who did great things for them. 
And as the, as the people were looking at that and the ungodly people, they were saying, great is the Lord. But yet the children of God were under the same agreement. Here in verse 3 it says, the Lord hath done great things for us. Isn't it wonderful to be able to look back upon life? And even in the midst of the difficulties and the trials and the tribulations, even as we're looking to do a work for the Lord, to be able to say the Lord had great, done great things for us. The Lord hath done great things for me. And I wonder, can you say that this morning? The Lord has done great things for you. Even in saving you, the Lord has done something wonderful. And he's done something special. And I trust you are saved this morning. That was the first question I asked Hannah there when she came up. But she's saved because I believe to do a work for the Lord and to do something for the Lord, you need to be saved. You need to know the Lord yourself before you can go out and tell others about the Lord. It's like me going out and telling somebody about an engine and how to work it. I don't have a clue. I know there's pistons, I know there's rings, I know there's, there's oil seal bearings. I know all of those things. I've heard them for years. But to take an engine apart and put it back together, don't come and ask me or listen to me because I don't really have much of a clue. The reality is you can only tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ if he's real, if he's in your heart, and if he's alive. And that's the tremendous reality. The Lord had done great things for me. And then I'm going out to share it with others. Tell others about what the Lord has done for you. Whereof we're glad. I wonder do you have that, just that gladness in your own heart this morning? That, that contentedness within your own heart. Because you know that you belong to the Lord. You know that you're endeavoring to live your life for the Lord. And that brings it with it a contentedness and a gladness. The Lord hath done great things for us whereof we are glad. There in verse 4, it tells about what he has done. He turned again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. As the stream is turned about, he turned around our life. And it's wonderful when we're saved, the Lord turns around our lives. But sometimes in, in the midst of our lives, the Lord turns around situations and he turns around difficult situations. And he works them out together for his good, for his honor, and for his wonderful glory. And the Lord can turn around your situation, whatever it is maybe you're going through, and he can turn it around for his honor, and he can turn it around for his glory. Now we're going to get on to the little portion we're looking at this morning. Because there in verses 5 and in verses 6 it says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Now I know a lot of the, a lot of the, the, the challenges on winning souls, a lot of the challenges on, on, on doing something for the Lord, we always kind of go to the New Testament. Because there there's a the great call to the church to go out and to reach out. And to talk about the Lord to others we come in contact with. But I think this is a lovely portion here. You know, so many times people miss going through the Old Testament and looking at the challenge in the Old Testament because there's a tremendous challenge even in the Old Testament and in the Old Testament, right, to go into to go in and to preach the word. There in Proverbs it said, He that winneth souls is wise. And folks, we need to be wise in these days. And the wisdom that we should have is the idea of winning souls for the Lord. You see, there's the art of soul winning. There's the art of soul winning. There's the desire of soul winning. And there's the actual soul winning itself that we're prepared to go out and we're prepared to do something for the Lord. So as you go into verses 5 and 6, you will see much here that will bring challenge and bring blessing and, 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 and that we can be involved. This is a personal challenge this morning. It's not just a challenge to us as a church, but it's a challenge to your own heart and it's a challenge to your own life this morning. Listen, Verses 5 and 6 give us the wonderful outline of the study, if you want to go into it, of winning souls for and to Christ. There in verses 5 and 6, we, we can look at a number of things. And I said this morning, we'll just spend a short while looking into verse 6. First of all, we have the Soul Winners Program. That's the important thing. What is the program of the Soul Winner? What is the program of someone who belongs to bring others into a saving faith of the Lord Jesus Christ? What are our orders? 
What are we need to be doing? You know, when I thought of what are our orders, I thought of a little chorus we sang there as a child. I may never march with the infantry, ride with the cavalry, shoot the artillery. I may never zoom more the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. We all know it, don't we? Because we learned it. But that's the simple reality, folks, for us today. We're in the Lord's army. And we're to be doing a work for the Lord today. And I want you to look at verse 6. And I want you to look at a few words. And just take those words out. And I'm sure they'll bring a challenge to your heart. And they'll bring a challenge to your life. Firstly, we have the word he. He that goes forth and weepeth. And the simple little thought here, when we have the word he, this word re reminds us that the soul winner is human. Human. He's not talking about the angels here. He's not talking about angelic beings. He's talking about human beings. Soul winners are those who have been saved by the grace of God themselves and have a desire within their heart to share the message of the gospel with others. That's what he means right at the very beginning when he says the word he. This is God's method of saving a lost world. You know, he could send all his angels out, but that's not his method. His method is for you and me to go out as individuals and share the message of the gospel with others. I was reading a little commentary there during the week and it said this, save sinners are to find lost sinners and save whosoevers are to find lost whosoevers. And the two little verses that came to my mind was Luke 19 and 10 when it talked about save sinners. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He's not coming to seek and to save the saved because they're already saved. But he's coming to seek and to save those who are lost, those who are outside of Christ, those who are going to a lost eternity, those who are going to end up, and I make. And, and folks, it's not an easy word to say at times, but are going to hell. That's the simple reality. And sometimes it can be those in our family circle. It can be those of our nearest and dearest. It can be those who were longing and loving. But that's the simple reality. They're lost and they're without Christ. And what's our desire to see their salvation? John 3 and 16 says, For God so loved the world that whosoever. You know, you can share the gospel with every person. You know, we can go into much doctrine, we can go into what people say and what people don't say. But I think everybody's right for the gospel. And I share it with everyone I come in contact with. You see, that's the whosoever. And the reality is, folks, when we meet someone, we share the gospel with them. That little verse I quoted earlier in Proverbs 11 and 30, it says, he that winneth souls is wise, is wise. You see, somebody who's been fallen, somebody who's been in sin, because the Bible says we've all sinned. We've all come short of the glory of God. And we think of how we've been saved ourselves, how we've come to Christ. Who's witness to us? What they've done? Aren't we the best people to go out and witness to others? You know, I can witness to those who've grown up in a Christian home because I grew up in a Christian home. But there's many who've grown up in Christian homes who've heard the message of the gospel and sadly not saved and sadly far away from God. You know, we know how to reach them because that's how we were reached ourselves. There are those who've been far away from God down in the depths of despair and in the depths of maybe drink or drugs or something else. Folks, we know how to reach them because maybe we've been there ourselves. That's the he who he's talking about here in this little por portion. Not the angels. That's why the hymn writer said, they have never known a fallen world. You see, the angels don't know, but we do. We live in it. That's where we have come from. And that's the great challenge to us to share the gospel with those who we know and where they've come from and where we long to see them going. We long to see them coming to Christ. Secondly, not only he, 
But here the, the second word, it says, he that goeth, goeth. And there in verse 6, I think this is a very important word. You see, this word implies, it implies action. It implies doing something. It implies going. It implies going. You see, the word go, if you look it up, it means to move on a course. It means to proceed. It means to act. It means doing something, doesn't it? You know, and folks, if we see people in danger physically, well, we'll go and help them, won't we? If we saw somebody drowned, in, we'd, we'd go and try and pull them out of the water. If we saw a car back and back and there was somebody behind it, we'd say, watch yourself there. But yet there's those who are, who are dying without Christ. And sometimes we, we watch them going past. And we do very little about it. You see, you might say to me, well, Mervyn, I, I'm busy in my own life. And I can understand that because we're all busy in our lives. But do you see faith, the scripture says, without works, it's dead because it's alone. And folks, we can have the greatest faith of all. But if we're not going or we're not doing something with that faith, it's, it's dead. It's, it's, it's alone. We have faith. But folks, we're not doing something about it. You see, the faith goes to action. And we're prepared to do something. And we need to be doing something in this world that we're living in today. There's people dying without Christ. And folks, we see a world that's, that's going from, from, from one bad thing to a worse thing. And you know we could start at where the laws they met a wee while back and you could come to see what they're doing in our national schools today and what they're trying to peddle to our children. The simple reality is, folks, we need to go out and we need to be speaking a word for the Lord. As I was thinking of those who, who the Lord called to do something. Now maybe this was into, into full time service. But I thought, I thought of them. They were all busy. They were actually all doing something. You know even Adam and Eve in the garden. Now we can look back and we can think it, it was perfect. But they had jobs to do in the garden of Eden. The Lord didn't say listen mope about all day. Don't be doing anything at all. You know he gave them work to do. And then in the cool of the evening, he went down and he walked with them and he talked with them. But they had jobs and they had work to do. When we think of Moses, he called him for caring for the sheep, didn't he? Moses was out in the field. He was looking after the sheep when God called him and he said, go, I have a work for you to do there in Exodus 3. He called Gideon. Gideon was, <coughs> excuse me, thrashing, a, thrashing the wheat in the wine press. Now, he might have been hidden away, but God brought him out into the center, and God says, here, go do a work for me. David, where was David? David was out in, in the backside of the desert, as it says in the authorized version. That's where he was. But yet God called him, and God used him in 1 Samuel 16. Nehemiah was serving the king. He was busy doing. And then he was asked to go, and he was asked to build the walls of Jerusalem. Peter, Andrew, James, John, they were fishing. And the, the Lord says, leave your nets. And the tremendous word, follow me. Matthew, a tax collector. I'm sure he didn't mind leaving his job when he was a tax collector. Sure didn't. But he did. He left his work and he went and he did something for the Lord. Can I say the main thing here is, is that we go, we go. Sometimes in church life, we love to see people coming in. And it's lovely to see people coming in. But nowhere in the scripture are we told to sit and wait for people to come in. We're always told to go. The Great Commission in Matthew 28 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's the Great Commission to go. Matthew, uh, Luke 14 and 23 says, Go ye in to the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be full. 
sometimes we look and we can ask the question, why are sometimes our churches empty today? Have we stopped going out? Have we stopped going out? Have we stopped compelling men and women and boys and girls to come in? To come in. You see, this is the great challenge for you and me. And I believe God will move and I believe God will... But we need the vision to, to go, don't we? We need the vision to go. And I wonder, the challenge is, will you go? Will you go? The second little word here, moving on quickly, third, or the third word, sorry, that we have is, is to go forth. There in verse 6, he that goeth forth. You see, the work implies leaving something behind, doesn't it? Will you, we're, we're, to, we're to go forth. Now, we could get into the line of, of sin within the heart and life because it's important, folks, that, that we be clean, the Scripture said, that bear the vessels of the Lord, that we know what it is to live a life that's pure, pure and clean and holy. And to do a work for God, I believe we need a life and we need to be living a life that is pure, pure and clean and holy. I was in Liz McCarroll there on Tuesday night and we were, we were looking at some of those thoughts. You know, whether it's an open sin or whether it's a hidden sin, we need, we, we need to put it behind us. We need to make sure as we're going to do something for the Lord that we know what it is to be clean. To have our garments white and spotless in a spiritual sense. To know what it is to be, to be free from sin within the life. And if there's open sin or there's hidden sin, we need to deal with it. The scripture says we go, we go back to the cross and the scripture says we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The scripture says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and then to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I looked at the little thought on, on Tuesday night. I'm not going to really go into it again. <clears throat> but we have sins that are committed, lied, stolen, covetousness we can go on they're there in in the commandments for us all to see you know the need to be put under the blood sin within we looked at the idea of pride we looked at the idea of anger we looked at the idea of unforgiveness within the heart and within the life we looked at the idea of jealousy you know those sins which which can be within and folks if we harbor those sins it's very hard to go out and reach people for the lost with sin within the heart and within the life. But can I also say that this word here not only suggests being clean and being pure, but the word also suggests the sacrifices that we have to give. You see, if we're going to go forth, it will take sacrifice. First of all, it takes time. You don't do it without taking time. You know, sometimes we often think, well, when time was made, there wasn't enough of it made. There's many who would like a 28 or 29 hour day because it's not, not long enough for them. They would like an eight day week. Some of us would maybe like a five day week or a six day week, but the reality is there's always who come. But it does take time, doesn't it? If we're going to do something for the Lord, it takes first of all time. It takes the giving and the using of our talents. Whatever talent God has given to you, Use it. Use it. Now, I must admit, folks, I, I'll be honest, I, I find it very hard to do door-to-door -door work. Now, I like getting into a house and getting to know people and getting my feet under the table, and then you, you can't get me out. That's my problem. But, but that's what I like to do. That's my forte. You know, going to a door, I, I don't like it at all. But I still go and do it. And I'll still knock that door. I remember I was here in Rafo, won't say where or what about, but I was in Rafo here one time and I was handing out leaflets for, for some of the missions or something and a wee man opened up the door to me. <clears throat> and he says, oh, you're back again. I says, that's right. And he says, what are you trying to, what are you trying to invite me to now? And of course, I, I shared with him what I was inviting him to and he smiled. I'll never forget this little thought he said. Well, he says, at least you come to my door to invite me. At least you come to my door to invite me. 
you know, can I ask you, will you go to somebody's door and invite them to come in? And it's not easy. I was looking at some of the things here, folks. We, we take our time, we take our, our talents, we take our ease. You know, it's far easier not to go. That's far easier for me anyway. And it's far easier for us all. And it'll be far easier for Hannah and Matthew if they stayed at home and just simply prayed for them. That's, that's easier, isn't it? It'll be easier not to be here from six to eight this coming week because there'll be bedlam. Because when all the kids come in, that's what it is. You'll need earplugs. But it's powerful to see them coming in. And it's powerful to see them sitting under the word of God. And sometimes we have to take our feelings and we have to put them to one side. Because let me tell you, when you're going to somebody's door, sometimes they'll say things maybe you don't want to hear. Sometimes they'll slam the door in your face because that has happened many a time. Now you'd wonder how anybody could slam the, slam the door on a face like mine, wouldn't you? But they'll do it. They'll do it. And that's the simple reality. I was chatting to John Weir there during the weekend or when he was here at the mission. And you know what he said? And I thought it was lovely. He said, you see the folks here in Rafaux? He said, they're a very friendly bunch. And they'll stop and talk to you. And even the young people. He said, the young people are very friendly. And they'll stop and they'll take the wee leaflets. I thought that was lovely to hear, isn't it? It's a nice indictment on the people around this area. To hear they'll take, because a lot of places, he said, you know, they won't take it. And they don't really want to know. But can I say, folks, here, we need something else. We need the Holy Spirit to go with us when we're going out to do a work for the Lord. And folks, with the Holy Spirit, he'll give us the strength to enable us to do it. There in Acts 1 and verse 8, it says, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and then unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Judea deals with it whole. Deals with it whole. And then it goes to the other extreme, right <coughs> to the ends of the earth. You see, first of all, I believe we're to do it here at home. Not the easiest thing to do. I remember a number of years ago, and I should have been finished a long time ago, but I'm going to tell you this story, and then I am finished. I remember a number of years ago, a fellow, Alistair Patterson, he asked me to go into Port Leash to hand out a few leaflets. And now he said, oh, pray about it and see what you feel. Now, I didn't need to pray about it. I didn't want to go. That's to be simple. And I thought, well, if so-and-so's walking up the street there on a Saturday night, where will I go? And I did not want to go to my local town to people I would know. But I couldn't say no to them because that, that just, you didn't do that as far as I was concerned. And I thought of many ways of getting out of it. You know, even once I thought, well, if I hurt my hand or I hurt my foot or I hurt something, I could maybe get out of it. That's how bad it was. But in the end, I went. In the end, I went. And I remember at the very end, I was walking up the street and I didn't see hardly anybody I knew. And I walked up the end of the street and he says, oh, Mervyn, we'll walk back up the street now and that'll do us for tonight. I thought, boys, I've got away here. I haven't seen anybody I knew. And the sweat was blinding me. And I walked up and here was a go of boys coming down the road and I knew about three or four of them. All young boys had done the green cert with. And I thought to myself, boys, what am I going to say here? And I kept walking and just from about me to Roy, they never saw me. And just about me to Roy there, didn't they pull into the chip shop? Boys, I was querned, lad. And I got on past. I got on past. But you know, I can still tell you their names today. Still tell you their names today. And you know, if it was today, I'd be glad to tell them about the Lord. You know, sometimes I look at that as a missed opportunity. And I can still remember it. You know, we go forth and we share the gospel with whoever we can.